Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our briefing this afternoon. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Uh, probably many of you have been to our briefings before, but EESI is a, is a nonprofit organization that was started more than 30 years ago by a bipartisan congressional caucus, the purpose of which was to really provide educational forums for policymakers and to point the way towards solutions that make sense and how we can bring people together to solve important energy and environmental problems and how we can work together in a way that is nonpartisan and is truly problem solving and that takes advantage of looking at the kinds of solutions and issues that are being faced by people across sectors and at every level of government at local, state, and national. And so in today's briefing, we are going to be taking a look at exactly what that means in terms of thinking about coastal communities and lessons in resilience that we are learning uh, so much information that we need to continue to, to gather and think about what that means as we seek to find ways that make sense to deal with our communities, uh, those terribly important communities and, and, and their economies. Um, and we are also so proud today to be hosting this briefing in conjunction with the National Association of Regional Councils, um, also referred to as NARC. And um, I would like to ask Leslie Wallach, who is the Executive Director of uh, NARC, to please introduce the organization. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you for all to be here. I'm Leslie Walk with the National Association of Regional Councils. We may have one of the very worst acronyms in DC, NARC, but it means that nobody ever forgets us. And many of our, many of our members love to introduce us because our acronym is worse than theirs. But we do represent regional councils. There are about 530 of them across the country. You may know them for the transportation planning they do as part of metropolitan planning organizations. But um, they are, have a broad range of issues. They are voluntary, uh, all run by local elected officials in the community who recognize that coming together to solve issues is much more effective and that a region only grows by bringing along all parts of the region. Um, we're so thrilled to have our neighbor and uh, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments here to talk about some of the range of programs that our members work on. Um, they, I've only been with NARC about three years. I'm just, we're always stunned to see the kind of issues that can really be solved by bringing a community together. We do social services, we do economic development, we do planning, but mostly it's about bringing different communities together in a region to solve and look at and provide a forum for how to bring a community forward. So with that, we're NARC, not NARC.org, and um, we look forward to the panel and hearing from all of you. Thanks so much. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Leslie. So our panel this afternoon, uh, again, is looking at coastal resilience. And these, what you're going to be hearing about are some of the challenges and some of the ways that these leaders are approaching things. And so they're important lessons that we all can learn from that, both in terms of the challenges as well as the kinds of resources that are needed, how we uh, could perhaps, uh, should perhaps uh, be thinking about things and what this means for also people in other coastal communities uh, because so much of our country as population is located along coastlines and therefore there is very valuable real estate. There are uh, extremely important um, uh, rivers, uh, ports, uh, airports that are extremely valuable and also critical in terms of making the infrastructure, the economies of all of these communities really work. At the same time, we have seen over the last number of years the horrific disasters uh, in terms of uh, the increased severity and number of extreme weather events that these communities are all having to deal with. Uh, and it is 
a struggle and it's how can we best build in greater resilience so as to minimize what the, the damage is, the hardship, the economic and human costs are. So to start off our discussion today, uh, we will first hear from Nicole Hefty, who is the Deputy Resilience Officer for Miami-Dade County. In this capacity, she is working directly with the, the Chief Resilience Officer in partnership with the Rockefeller's 100 Resilient Cities, as well as the local partners in terms of the City of Miami and the City of Miami Beach to develop a resilient strategy for the whole Greater Miami and the beaches. Uh, Nicole also coordinates the county's sustainability plan, which is called Greenprint. And she is also um, uh, leading the county's climate change and sea level rise efforts. And in that particular capacity, she has been serving as a steering committee member for the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact, which I believe involves four counties, uh, which is itself an enormous accomplishment. And I think another terrific example of people coming together, knowing that it's not just about me, it's about all of us, and how do we work together to solve um, the, the problems that we're now seeing. Nicole? Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, introduce everyone to our challenges and some of the things that we're doing to tackle those challenges in Southeast Florida, both at the local and the regional level. So uh, we're no stranger to climate change impacts. We are experiencing fluctuations in precipitation patterns and temperature extremes, and those can have uh, some, some significant impacts on our economy, and, and for example, with regards to agriculture and tourism. And of course, we are no stranger to extreme events. Um, obviously, this year was a pretty, or I should say last year, was a pretty challenging year. Um, we feel like we really dodged the bullet because if we had been hit directly by a Category 5 hurricane, uh, the damages would have been extremely more severe. Um, and we experienced a Category 5 with Hurricane Andrew, and that resulted in a lot of changes that I'm going to mention today. Um, Sea level rise, of course, coastal, low-lying community. Uh, it has us in the headlines, it seems, almost every day. Um, and I think if you believe all of those, you probably think we're already underwater, but we're not. And we're fighting that, and we're doing what we can um, proactively. But it does certainly impact um, our, uh, our, and our tides. We are having more frequent what they call king tides on a sunny day. Some of the streets are flooded. Um, as a result of that, and uh, certainly does impact coastal erosion, which we spend a lot of money on beach renourishment, so that's a pretty significant economic impact. And in addition to that, uh, sea level rise does amplify the vulnerability of our coastal infrastructure to storm surge. So we are very fortunate because we have tremendous academic resources in Southeast Florida, and we benefit from that in the sense that we have a lot of scientists really looking, gathering data, and really studying some of these issues. And so one of the things that's very helpful is being able to predict and anticipate these king tides because if we have the opportunity to warn the community ahead of time, they can move their cars because salty water is not good for uh, vehicles, for example, um, certainly does impact mobility and, and also the economy and, and some of the business that gets done. So um, this, is, this graph actually shows a prediction from uh, Professor Brian McNulty at the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School for Marine and Atmospheric Science. And he's utilizing 37 different parameters to predict the amplitude and the frequency of expected king tides this coming fall. So it's a, a complex science. Um, there's a lot of factors that affect it. And so it's really helpful to have these resources at our disposal. One of the biggest challenges, uh, South Florida, the water in South Florida is very highly managed um, for agriculture, for water supply, and uh, for flood control. And one of the challenges is that our substrate is porous rock. 
The benefit is that the water flows very freely um, underneath. Our sole source of drinking water is a shallow Biscayne aquifer. It's replenished readily by the Everglades, so the Everglades are very important in that respect and for many other reasons. Uh, but the challenge is that it's also hydrologically connected to the ocean. So as sea level rises, we can anticipate that the water level um, of the groundwater table is going to increase. Uh, threat of, of saltwater intrusion into our, our drinking water wells. And in addition, today, some of the impacts are that our stormwater infrastructure is designed to work by gravity to let the water flow um, out, uh, down and out. And so though that infrastructure, particularly along the coast, provides a direct conduit for those high tides to come right into the streets and onto the, the land. So that is a challenge that we're addressing. Um, in addition to that, the South Florida Water Management District has what's called salinity structures. These are, again, um, gates that just go up and down to let the water out. Um, those are raised in advance of heavy precipitation events and for various other reasons to manage the water. But sometimes because of the high tide and as a result of sea level rise, you, you can't always operate those gates in that manner. You have to leave them closed. So there have been some instances where we've had to retrofit these gates at great expense to include pumps for those opportunities or those times when we cannot uh, operate the standard gates. So what I have discovered um, over time is the fact that even though we, we haven't created particular programs in the name of adaptation or the name of resilience, we've actually been adapting and building resilience for quite a long time. Um, starting from the 1970s when we started renourishing the beaches, uh, we started protecting environmentally sensitive land, which we understand now has a lot of additional benefits than just habitat. Um, as I mentioned, Hurricane Andrew uh, was a big game changer in South Florida. It resulted in much stronger building codes. It resulted in a local mitigation strategy that allows us to, to put projects on a list and prioritize for funding when it does become available. And um, we have a very robust stormwater modeling and master plan program that allows us, amongst other things, to have a CRS or a community rating uh, system rating of five, which is very good. So these programs have been in existence for some time, and again, really allowing us to build that adaptation foundation and building the resilience long before we even started really focusing on specifically climate change adaptation. So in 2009, we were fortunate to have elected officials in the South Florida region, uh, the four counties, Monroe, Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach, start talking about the fact that we had our climate change programs. We were already talking about these things. We were trying to do things about it. And we were doing things individually using different numbers, which really didn't make sense. So thanks to their leadership in 2010, um, and let me just back up for a minute, it made sense. They realized it made sense to collaborate on a regional basis because we had tremendous natural resources to protect uh, that were also important to our economy. And we had uh, very similar economic drivers. We had a very narrow but connected regional transportation system. And more importantly, the four counties represent 30% uh, of the state's population. So they realized that if we collaborated, we would have a much stronger voice at the state and federal level. So in 2010, all four counties adopted the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact and became formal members. And this was an agreement for us to work collaboratively as a region on climate mitigation and adaptation policies and action. And we agreed that we were going to develop resources and, and inform our communities so we could plan. And we also agreed we would develop a regional climate action plan, as well as come together on an annual basis to keep the community and our elected officials informed of the work that we were doing, the progress we had made, and where we were headed in the future. So the steering committee is comprised of two representatives from each of the four counties, one representative from a municipality from each of the counties. We also have a representative from the Nature Conservancy, the South Florida Water Management District, and the South Florida Regional Planning Council. And the steering committee meets on a regular basis. We have different work groups that um, work on different projects and develop different um, 
documents and, and resources and tools. So it's been a very uh, robust process that we've been able to uh, engage in. And one of the most important and first things that we did is we brought together those academic resources that I mentioned. And we also were able to get representation from the Army Corps of Engineers, the US Geological Survey, and also the South Florida Water Management District. And we developed a unified sea level rise projection for Southeast Florida that we all agreed we would use uh, for our planning purposes. And again, this was important because we were all prior to this using different numbers, different projections, different time frames. And so this really allowed us to um, have a standard measurement. And the first one was uh, produced in 2011. The group agreed they would come together and look at new data and modeling, and of course, uh, specific uh, information about our region, such as the Gulf Stream that really infects, affects local sea level rise, and update the projection as needed. And so this is the most recent update. Uh, it was released in 2015, and as you can see, we really relied a lot on the work done by the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, NOAA. And uh, this allows, there's a guidance document that goes with it, allows planners um, for infrastructure or land use to decide based on the criticality and the lifespan of the project or the infrastructure to decide which curve they feel is most appropriate for them for them to plan for for that particular project. So it really is a valuable tool that we're using in Southeast Florida. In addition, uh, this is actually our second update, or our first update of our Regional Climate Action Plan. We spent all of last year updating it, and we released it in December of 2017. And as opposed to the first document, which was, or the first plan that was a, a actually a printed document, this one is really a much more um, uh, interactive online tool. It has links to case studies, resources, tools. We're going to continue to update that as things become available. And you can actually go in and you can pick a different discipline or um, a topic and it'll actually populate um, uh, an example of a, a climate action plan that you might want to build upon for your own uh, use. So at the local Miami-Dade level, we are looking, we, we kind of uh, are tackling this at all levels um, with different buckets. We're looking at strengthening our infrastructure, um, uh, building resilient communities, working more with our communities that are being impacted on a regular basis. Um, what do we need to do for uh, economic resilience, particularly with regards to insurance, because we understand that that is going to be a very important driving factor as we go forward. And then looking at making sure we are continuing to protect and enhance our natural resources. So one of the things that we are almost finished with right now, uh, we spent the last year meeting with our critical infrastructure departments and asking them to look at the infrastructure that they have and bait, uh, use a, a matrix to look at the criticality of that infrastructure. And then we looked at the vulnerability to sea level rise and storm surge. And from that process, we looked at 700 67 different projects and pieces of infrastructure. And through that progress, uh, process, we came up with 154 priority uh, projects that we now need to look at and look at how we can reduce that vulnerability and changes that we need to make. So that is kind of the next step from this process, in particular for county infrastructure. Um, we are trying to look at creative ways. Um, we know that there's no silver bullet. Uh, and we are going to have to really be uh, thoughtful in how we do this because we don't want to have any unintended consequences. So some of the things that we're doing are changing our design standards. Our water and sewer department has been very proactive in that respect because they are, uh, they've already started a $13 billion infrastructure improvement program. So they're looking at sea level rise, storm surge, and changing the design standards to make that infrastructure uh, less vulnerable to sea level rise and storm surge in the future. Um, the bottom uh, picture is actually an interesting example of working together, the county and the city. The city of Miami Beach was already raising roads in a particular area which connected to a county road. And although the improvements um, on the county behalf weren't scheduled for quite a bit later, we were able to work out an agreement where they they changed the um, the schedule to make this project 
more resource um, effective and of less costly. So by doing it together in a timely fashion, we were able to, to save money in the future. Um, and then looking at the infrastructure with regards to pumps, do we need to, to install pumps in certain areas that we hadn't in the past? And making sure that when we do that, we're thinking about elevation and keeping those pumps out of um, the storm surge or, or uh, flooding. In addition, I wanted to mention uh, one of the work groups from the Compact, the Shoreline Resilience uh, Working Group, because this again was a collaborative effort that engaged staff from all four counties, really looking at um, the, the, um, the natural systems and natural uh, attributes that we had along the coastline, understanding that not only do we, the, from the benefits that they provide for habitat, uh, for uh, storm surge attenuation, uh, and for the economy, that we needed to really try to enhance and protect them. So this was an opportunity to identify all those projects so we can then take the next step to determine how we need, what we need to do as a community, as a region, to better uh, enhance them. And the last thing I want to mention is the 100 Resilient Cities process um, and the program that we are a member of because we're a little different. Uh, prior to uh, the county joining, it was a city uh, program. It was the, the members are cities. But in the third round, we were given the indication that the county would be eligible. And because of the great collaboration and relationships that we built through the compact process, we agreed to partner with the City of Miami and the City of Miami Beach on our application. We call ourselves Greater Miami and the Beaches, and sometimes we like to refer to ourselves as the three-headed monster. Um, but uh, very challenging for us all to be working together on this, but it, it is working because of the relationship that we had built prior to this process. Um, all three entities have a, a chief resilience officer and a deputy, so the six of us form our primary team with assistance from Resilient Cities and also from our strategy partner, which is AECOM, to develop a, a resilient strategy. And when we had when we applied, we had to identify our top shocks and stresses. And when we went into this process, we really were kind of going in thinking of the, the climate and the sea level rise and flooding impacts. But as we started really talking about it, we realized that uh, we had to focus as well on the lack of affordable housing in our community, an insufficient transportation system, and uh, pronounced poverty. And all of these things, as you all well know, are very connected and exacerbated by uh, some of the climate and sea level rise impacts that I've mentioned today. So we've spent over a year in stakeholder process. Um, the Resilient Cities program has a very prescribed process that they have you go through in order to develop your resilient strategy. So we're about halfway through. And we are now um, focusing on what's called our discovery areas. And these are centered around the, the shocks and stresses I mentioned in addition to uh, health issues in the community. That was something that bubbled up through our stakeholder process that we also needed to focus on. And we have work groups associated with this. And in the end of this six to eight month process, we will come out with a list of policies and projects that we anticipate putting in our resilience strategy. And I want to end with this graphic because I think it really shows you um, visually the benefits that we have uh, experienced as a result of our collaboration at the regional level. I've worked on climate change issues for over 20 years, and I can tell you firsthand that the momentum that we have been able to build and the work that we've been able to accomplish because of our collaboration at the regional level has been tremendous. And a lot of it is not only because we've pooled our resources and we have a stronger voice, but because we have drawn in interest because we're working together as a region and these organizations, and I apologize because I'm sure there are some that aren't on there that I should represent because um, you know every month someone else is, is helping us in one way or another. but. If we hadn't come together as a region, we would not have benefited from the resources and the funding and the expertise that these agencies and organizations have provided to the work that we're doing in Southeast Florida. So I think that is, you know, collaboration is really the primary 
learning that uh, we've done and, and what I've experienced personally. Thank you. It is, I must say, it is just very impressive what all you and your colleagues are, are doing. And I think that, I mean, it's, it almost feels kind of overwhelming in terms of thinking about all the stakeholders, all of the people that are being brought together in all of the issues and how it's, it's got to be amazing for everyone to always see that they're, no matter what sector it is, it is connected and therefore it does need to be addressed uh, in, in the whole picture. And as I also um, just heard the other day too, you are also dealing with a substantially growing population and that you do have some land resource constraints and you are also, as you mentioned, in terms of the, the Everglades, that, that you are dealing with a, with a lot to deal with the population growth and all of these issues that you are talking about. So I think we have a lot to learn from Miami-Dade. Um, and so because we're dealing with, with these different areas um, of our country and that have very, very substantial populations. I want to turn next to Steve Waltz, who is from here um, in, in the district where he is the Director of Environmental Programs for the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, our own local COG, right? And, but what's, but this area is also really quite incredible because this population keeps growing and growing also, and that we're dealing with several million in terms of these communities, and there are a lot of communities that are all part of the Washington uh, Metropolitan Council of Governments, which means a lot more stakeholders that have to be brought together and to deal with, and it is so it's not easy to think about all of these different interests. And so Steve has, is responsible at the COG for water, air quality, waste management, energy, and climate planning. Not too shabby a portfolio, right? And he has more than 38 years experience working on energy sustainability and environmental protection issues. And he came to WashCOG after having served uh, again at the at the regional level as a director of as the director of the regional energy planning with the Northern Virginia Regional Commission, and then he'd also been the director of the Virginia Department of Mines, Minerals and Energy, and had been a senior uh, energy policy advisor to then Governor uh, Kane. So, Steve, welcome. Thank you very much. It's amazing to, to hear what uh, another area and region is doing and see a lot of the similarities. Um, so we maybe have a 22-headed monster that we're trying to deal with here. Um, um, with uh, And when I think of what people in Pennsylvania and elsewhere have to deal with in the number of jurisdictions, we're, we're really fortunate to only have 22, um, where they may have 222 in some of theirs. Um, so um, looking at the audience, I don't, don't know that all of you will get this, but I thought I'd shamelessly steal from the talking heads and, and start out to say, and you may ask yourself, well, what am I, what, um, how did I get here? being from metropolitan Washington in a, um, in a program that is looking at coastal areas. Um, we really need to think about that coastal areas really are much more than just along the ocean and the coastline. Um, we here on the Potomac River were at, at the, um, the head of the tidal Potomac River and the Anacostia River. And actually, as we have been modeling some of the storms and looking at some of the types of effects that could happen in here, if a storm were to come up the Chesapeake Bay and up the Potomac River, it would be funneling all of that water into the more narrow and narrow place, which means the water goes up more. Um, and so we really do have um, a lot of risk here, and we consider ourselves a coastal area for, for these purposes. Uh, we do have population growth, as you said, over the next 20 years, about 1.2, 1.3 million people, adding to about the 5.3 million people who are here um, today. And really, we're almost merging with the Baltimore, Washington area in many, many ways if they do the, some of the very, very high-speed um, transportation work. If we're 15 minutes by train to Baltimore, 
it would really become one large uh, metropolitan area, which would be the third or fourth largest in the country. And so you don't think of Washington and those in DC in those in those terms, but it is. Also due to our geography, we not only have the tidal and the storm surge flooding, but we, um, it's exacerbated with the river basin flooding coming down from storms to um, that come down the Potomac and the um, interior drainage-based flooding. And we've had um, um, healthy examples or maybe da dangerous examples of all three. Our flood of record here was, and we think about how it's growing, but we also really have to look back to learn. Our flood of record here came in October 1942, when there was um, very, very heavy rain up in the, um, in the Potomac Basin, so that was river rain flooding. And down around the southwest waterfront here in the district, there was 11 feet of floods into the southwest waterfront um, in 1942. But we also do get the storm surge flooding, Hurricane Isabel, in 2003. There were 10 feet of flooding in the southwest waterfront. And so we can, we can get lots of water from multiple directions. And then in um, 2006, the National Archives basement was flooded out, and they were having to hustle to get a many of the national treasures that, at, treasures that at the time were stored down in the basement and are no longer stored in the basement. That was flooded along with many of the other um, museums and other buildings along the mall. Um, we've had in, as late, uh, in 2012, the Bloomingdale neighborhood up in um, Northwest Washington was flooded out um, so that you know people walking waist deep and, and deeper and then our national monuments, um, if you're walking around the World War II monument, the 100-year floodplain is about here in the World War II monument. If you go down to the uh, Martin Luther King um, Memorial, the 100-year floodplain is about here. Now those were designed so all of the critical components of the electricity and everything is located up above the 100-year floodplain. So when they designed those, they took that into account. But it, when we look and think about the flood risk here, it's really quite great. Um, so with this region facing all of these issues, much like Miami, um, we've been doing things for quite a long while. Um, I didn't go back into the 70s, but as I was looking at yours, I was thinking, gee, that a lot of things really were done um, from flood control projects on the, the, the run, the stream that feeds into the Potomac near where I live, that we're actually now redoing. Um, because we're not just building concrete walls for, for flood, um, but it goes back quite a ways. But we've recognized the types of things that we have to do um, in um, projecting risks to the people and the places in our region. We will have many, many more heat emergency days. Um, the um, counterparts to um, um, Miami that look for the district here have done some studies and I think the baseline for days over 95 in Washington DC that they looked at um, which we call kind of critical heat days or heat emergency days was in the dozen or so um, and by um, 2080 in the low scenario, it would be in the 75 or 80 days over 95 degrees, and in the high scenario, it would be more than that. Um, and so as we look at, you know, I was somewhat joking that we'll have um, Charleston, South Carolina weather here at, at some point here. We will also, though, and you don't think about this here, have more frequent drought conditions. You may not have realized that um, as of a week ago, we were in severe drought here in the District of Columbia. Um, now the NOAA just lowered us to moderate drought in most of the district and outside of it, um, um, rain shortages areas, but you don't really think about that. When we think about the risks, 70% of the drinking water for the 5.3 million people in this region comes out of the Potomac River. So that's one source for all of those, all, all of those folks. We get to daily monitoring of the river flows in the summer as the flows get down so that we know that if we would have to put um, restrictions in place. Um, we, we have planning for that. So really this more frequent drought conditions is something we'll face here. We're looking at higher winds, the wind maps that you use for construction purposes, you know, looking at how those need to change over time. We're looking at worse air quality. It used to be in this region that if it got over 90 degrees out at Dulles International Airport, we had an unhealthy air day here. 
um, probably a code red air day where it was unhealthy for everybody, not just those with asthma and other things. Um, we have been reducing the air pollution in this region, so now we've broken that linkage between the 90 degree trigger. Um, but still, as we go from you know 12 days over 95 to 70 days over 95, it's going to have a lot of pressure on air quality in the region here, which then has the follow through effect on public health. We're looking at our infrastructure vulnerabilities, much as, as you were talking about, um, transportation, energy, water, and communications. And we're looking at all of the connections between them. If we get a storm and we lose electricity, if we lose all of our water pumping, then we don't have water, which means our sewers don't flush and we don't have sewers which means we have all of these other types of problems that we have to deal with, um, ranging from what do you do with people in nursing homes and hospitals, and all of those many, many um, types of cascading impacts that come from this type of work. So we're really taking a look at what are those cascading impacts as part of the broader resiliency issue. We're talking about coastal cities, but I think as, as um, was pointed out, it's much more than just flooding is, is what we have to look at. Um, we're looking at the community vulnerabilities to themselves, you know, the, the fabric of the communities and how people can take care of each other and, and how that will be affected and where people will be able to go and shelter if they need to, um, whether it be for heat or for flooding or, or for um, other things. And then the natural resource damages that can be um, great in this area here. This particular area, we're really, we're not north and we're not south, we're in this zone between things. And so the range of natural resources that we have in the metropolitan Washington area Area through really to the coastline is enormous. If you go out into the ocean on the coast, there'll be kind of alpine types of, um, of, of critters down in the water as well as tropical critters down in the water there because of the way the, 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 the Gulf Stream flows and, and where everything is. So we have a really high vulnerability to our natural systems. Um, so again, we've recognized this risk. That's one thing, but acting is really quite another. Um, we go back quite a bit of time doing a lot of work on natural resource protection, but we really, in 2007 and 2008, in this region, um, tried to look at it more than just in a city by city basis and put together a regional national capital region climate change report and in there recognized that we need to be preparing for the impacts of climate change that we've talked about here and so that was really kind of one of the first documents that we've put down and say this is something that we need to do and we also set our goals for mitigation and reducing greenhouse gas emissions that we are measuring across the region to see if we're going to be able to meet these aggressive goals that are based upon the IPCC standards. It's going to be really, really tough to meet those goals, but we're working on it. Um, in 2009, on the Maryland side, Montgomery County um, issued their um, climate protection plan. Um, in 2011, we were looking at smart growth um, and how we can use smart growth strategies to address climate resiliency as well as transportation and many other things. We kind of looked at climate impact symposiums. And because this is Washington, D.C., and we have such a high um, concentration of federal activities here, when in 2013, when Executive Order 13653 was issued about preparing the U.S. for the impacts of climate change, that directed all of the federal agencies to develop climate adaptation plans. Well, they had a thought, a lot of people at the agencies kind of scratching their heads saying, I don't really know how to do that. So we brought together excerpts from NASA, from NOAA, from um, other federal agencies, from the academic community, um, and with the people in the agencies who will be working on these climate plans, and with many of the local government folks who are working on these climate plans, to provide some training and orientation and, and resources. And NASA at the time did some projections of temperature rises, sea level rises, and others for this region as part of that process. Since then, it has been updated by the district, for example, in its work, um, but that was the start of that work. Um, we brought help from EPA in and, again, looked at smart growth strategies. Um, we um, Then um, Sandy came up the East Coast 
and changed a fair amount of thinking really up and down the East Coast. We were fortunate that it stayed a little bit off to the east here, so we didn't have the type of effects that we could have had that New York and others saw. But out of that, um, the Corps of Engineers did the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study that identified nine areas that they need to really focus in more um, directly on to look at um, flood risk mitigation and what can be done. I noticed the Corps was a key um, partner with the work that you're doing. Um, and so that was done. DC was one of those nine areas. In parallel to this, um, the district put out his Climate Ready DC plan, which is a very comprehensive plan that is then now being integrated into a lot of the other work of the other departments across the district. Um, but it talks about all of the risks that they're facing and then how, what are the types of actions they need to put in place across the district. Um, I noticed one of your partners was the Institute for Sustainable Communities, and I think I was with some Miami folks um, last year out in Denver at a training session. So we're bringing in these other types of NGOs to work with us here, similar to, I think, the, 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 the many people that you showed on your slides there. Um, DC was fortunate in the fourth round to be selected as in the final round of the 100 Resilient Cities, so they now have their Chief Resiliency Officer and Deputy Chief Resiliency Officer um, um, here who is working on that. We're also putting things in place on the ground, be it the 500-year um, um, flood wall around the primary wastewater treatment plant for this region. About 60% of all of the sewer and wastewater in the metropolitan Washington region all get treated at this one plant down on the Potomac, down in, in the south um, eastern corner of the district. Um, and as they're doing renovations and rebuilding around the plant, they're building kind of, they're not done yet, but they're slowly building a 500-year flood wall around that whole plant as part of their work. And they've realized that this is a very long-term investment, billions of dollars of investment that they have there. It's got to keep working, and so moving it up to that level is, it was justified. Um, there's levees that, have been, uh, that are being built down in the Huntington area um, of Fairfax County, just on the other side of Alexandria, as we're looking at flooding. Um, there's work in the Anacostia um, as part of the whole Anacostia restoration process. So there's a lot of on-the-ground work that is being done around all of these plannings. Um, I, I did mention the, um, the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study. Out of that, we were one of these nine areas, so now we are working with the Corps of Engineers on a multi-year, multi-million dollar coastal flood risk assessment. We'll be doing things like modeling the storms that can come up through this region. We're modeling about 100 or so actual storms and about 1,000 synthetic storms. And so we'll be able to then look at what pieces of critical infrastructure would be flooded under what types of storms. So for planning purposes, that'll give us a lot of information about that, but also for emergency response purposes. If we see a storm coming up, we'll be able to look at what was the modeled storm that most likely fits that and have some sense of where we need to pre-position resources, where we need to evacuate people. You were talking about doing the messaging and things. And so out of this study, we see these types of things happening. Um, and it's critical that we have the core doing this here. We're a place that we have two states and the district. So I talked about 22, uh, a 22-headed monster with our localities, but we're really a three-headed monster maybe with the district and the two states. Um, and maybe four-headed monster if you include the, the federal government in that too. Um, um, we're also, again, continuing to develop these other tools. Just in February, this month, the National Capital Planning Commission put out its flood risk management planning resources for Washington, D.C. And so they're bringing a lot of the tools into the hands of the planners. And so as we're looking at how do we size things properly to look into the future, the tools are there. And then we're taking the Northern Virginia region has um, just is, is um, finalizing a critical infrastructure roadmap for the Northern Virginia section of our area. And then we're going to take that and kind of expand it out to the region as, as they finish with theirs. So there's a lot of this planning that goes on, but we need these groups that can knit it together because the storms don't just stop at the district boundary or at um, Fairfax County's boundary or something like that. Um, we do have this critical infrastructure that we all rely on. And so lessons that we've learned from this include scope for success is a kind of a term that we use. So we look at 
what are the sectors that we want to focus in on? And focus in on them and work hard on those sectors. Don't get so broad that you you can't do anything. Look at what impacts do we want to try and address? What are the geographic areas? Um, we got to consider the context. What are the drivers? What are the current issues that we can look at, like a Hurricane Sandy, to be able to raise the awareness of this? We have to define our risk tolerance. Um, we don't have all the money in the world for, for everything, and so we need to think about, well, what risk is it that we can face? And that's something that, again, at a regional level, we really need to look at, because if we're looking uh, planning for one risk in um, Loudoun County and one risk in Montgomery County with just the Potomac River between them, we're going to have some disconnects that we really cannot have in order to be effective with our work. Um, define the scenarios, gather a lot of feedback, um, think regionally, multi-stakeholder, and then mainstream all of these strategies that we come up with. And I think that is critical that it gets folded into the um, comprehensive plans that the cities and counties have and other work like that. And then we have to communicate the plan um, both to the public to be able to grow support for the investments that we'll have to make in these as well as so that they'll know what they need to do. So again, a lot going on at the local levels. Um, we're trying to knit it together regionally in a very similar way and I think that that's a model that we'll have to follow because as I said, the storms don't stop at the jurisdictional lines. So I hope that gives some background and glad to be um, taking questions later. Thanks. And the third person on our panel uh, it comes from Charleston, South Carolina. And Mark Wilbert uh, took on just last year the role of Chief Resilience Officer for the city of Charleston. But it was, I would say, a rather natural evolution to that role since he had been the city's emergency manager for four years. So that pretty well equipped him. And of course, he also brought a wealth of experience having served on active duty in the U.S. Coast Guard for more than 30 years, uh, retiring at the rank of captain. And, and of course, the Coast Guard, I think, is such an amazing organization, um, such an amazing agency in terms of thinking about the breadth of, of the, it, its activities, its responsibilities, uh, all of the things to which it must respond. And so he had been involved in the planning and management of many large-scale operations, including uh, the Coast Guard's response to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So that forces one to have to think about, again, all sorts of players that have to be brought together dealing with very urgent situations and how do we both solve problems and also prevent things from happening in the future. So um, I'm delighted to introduce now Mark Wilbert. Good afternoon, and first of all, I'd like to thank um, EESI and, and NARC for having me up here today. This is great. It's a wonderful trip, and I uh, certainly would great hearing from the two cities before us here. I mean, just, uh, it, you know, it's, it's like we're all going down the same journey. Um, I, I would have to say that both of these cities are ahead of us, and it's always great to learn from people that, whose journey uh, have kind of walked in the path before you. I think the biggest difference for us in the city of Charleston is size and scope. I mean, I won't do the comparison, but these cities and these regions are different, but our journey really is the same. But my, my remarks today are really to talk about the city of Charleston's journey because it's an, I think it's interesting. Um, Charleston is a city, one of the most historic places in our country, and, but Charleston is a city with a flooding problem. Um, we've been flooding almost since the beginning. We go back to 1800. Um, and it's our number one priority. Our mayor this year declared our number one priority in building a city that is resilient and can, adapt, and can adapt to the changing environment where we can still enjoy the beauty the, and the historic and cultural treasures that people have come to know Charleston for. And that's the reason that we have Charleston and people want to be there. And so our goal is to keep Charleston as Charleston is to the best we can and still deal with the challenges that we have. Um, I think it's important to understand that resilience is uh, certainly about economics. You know, I don't want to lose that. Uh, we're at the port. Uh, the port uh, provides $53 billion worth of uh, 
economic impact to the city every year, 200,000 jobs to the city. Uh, last year we had a 10% increase over the previous year in terms of activity at the port. It drives jobs, manufacturing jobs. We're building Boeing airplanes in Charleston now. We're building uh, Mercedes vehicles. We're building Volvo cars. We've built BMWs. We do all kinds of things. A lot of folks around the country don't even know we do, and all of it's really tied to the port and the economic impact. But really, just as important for us in the city of Charleston is that resilience is about getting down to the personal level. Uh, I can't tell you how many times uh, I've sat in people's living rooms and just talked about their experiences with flooding and what it does to their life and their livelihoods, uh, second, third, fourth time that their house is flooded, what it does to their kids, what it does to their psyche, what it does to them, what it does to neighborhoods. And it's really, it really gets you when you see that. Uh, likewise, you talk to, and it's interesting, and to this morning I was making a round in the building here at a different, and people are coming up and grabbing me going, you're from Charleston, let me tell you this story. And one of the stories that really sticks out with me are these nurses uh, that we, our big hospital district is downtown and these uh, young nurses, their moms, their nurses, they've got to get to work on time and they have to drive through the area of the city that floods the worst. Okay, so their life is just challenging enough as it is with their daily things, never mind having to deal with the amount of nuisance flooding that we have. So resilience really matters to us, so we've really leaned into it. Um, like many coastal cities, um, we got in trouble, we started filling in the marsh. But you know, who knew better in the 1800s? It seemed like the thing to do, right? It stunk at low tide. We had all this debris from the earthquake. Let's start filling it in and great new land. It sounded like a great idea, uh, right? <laughs> Not really such a great idea now. We're a lot smarter than we were then, and so we're gonna have to go back and do something about that. Unfortunately, in the meantime, we've got a couple hundred years of building on it and putting new pipes in the ground and doing different things. So it really presents a, a problem. Uh, our flooding problem has historically been seen uh, primarily as a drainage issue, and the city's efforts really um, were primarily focused on drainage solutions. It's important to note that back in 1984, all the way back in 1984, we did a master drainage plan, and um, after that plan started, the Charleston really jumped into a formidable effort of addressing our flooding problem with um, significant engineering projects. We tunneled down 140 feet, dig 40 feet tunnels, go under the city, come up in the middle of the harbor and pump the water out. It's, I mean, that's the only way we get it out, similar to other cities, coastal cities that do it. Um, we haven't been cheap about it. We put our own money into it. Right now, we've got about $238 million invested. That's our money with a little bit of help from the federal and state government. We got about another $400 million of identified engineering projects that we're already working on uh, in one phase or another, and another two or $300 million um, of work that we know is gonna have to be done. We just really haven't started uh, any of the engineering work on that. So what I've been trying to stress to people today as I walk around the halls here is that, you know, Charleston does put skin in the game. We've got a lot of our own money, a lot of our own effort that we're putting into these challenges. But really our resilience journey, what I'm here to talk about today, started in earnest in 2014, 2015, um, where we released our sea level rise strategy. And uh, in December 21st, right as our mayor, uh, our former mayor, Mayor Joe Riley, who had been our mayor for 40 years, was just about to leave office. And he said, you know, I've got to do something about this. I want this sign before I walk out the door. And he did. And our next mayor, Mayor uh, John Tecklenburg, who came in, he picked it up and he's made it his number one priority since he came in. At the time that we published it, it was a true strategy. Um, it de defined and explained the problem, um, and it laid out guiding principles to address the problems. And we initially started out with uh, be ready, respond, and reinvest. Those were our three principles. We had 76 initiatives tied to that. Um, that could be grouped in different ways, and we just put them into the strategy and said, these things work. We've, we've looked elsewhere and we looked. And then what we did, we spent about a year with department heads in the city, and I led a group of about every two weeks, we got all the department's heads in the city, and everybody here knows how difficult that is to do, but we made it a priority. You're gonna come to these meetings and we're gonna go through these strategies one by one, or these initiatives one by one. We're gonna look at them and we're gonna prioritize them, we're gonna get them in the 2018 budget, and we're gonna start to make a difference. So we did that. But since we started that, uh, we've had three storm events, uh, one being a record-setting rain event, a thousand-year, I don't like to use that term, but it's a thousand-year uh, rain event, uh, others would call it, um, and two near-record storm surge events, all of which caused significant damage and impact to the city. Uh, our nuisance flooding problem is really becoming a nuisance. Um, I should say our tidal flooding problems really becoming a nuisance. Uh, back in the 1970s, we had about two days a year of nuisance flooding. 
Um, last year we had 50, 2016 we had 50, uh, and by 2040 we're projected to have over 180 days of tidal flooding, which will bring some type of water, put some type of water on the street. Um, the sea level rise gauge at the, uh, I'm sorry, the tide gauge at the uh, Charleston Customs House is the only tide gauge I talk about because that's the one I want to keep referencing. Uh, historically, the tides, as you've seen here, have been going up for about 100, I'm sorry, over 100 years. They're going about one foot over 100 years. The last seven years, that's increased by a factor of four. Uh, we all know there's different factors that can cause that, and the scientists that certainly we were talking about earlier, they can tell you what it is. It has something to do with the jet stream. It has to do with pushing it closer. It has to do with you know, the climate. It has to do with all of that. The, rea the, the reality on the ground is it's going up by a factor of four, and people are going, why am I flooding here more now than I did just four years ago? And the reason is because it's happening faster than it was the previous 100 years. So now we're looking at it, just like uh, has been mentioned before, we, um, we're revising our strategy. We went from one and a half to two and a half using the exact same factors that Miami did, and I'm sure Washington, D.C. did. And uh, next week, we're reconvening our science group, where we're going to look at it, and we suspect it might creep up a little bit, probably closer to one and a half to three, just in a three-year period is what we're expecting, but we'll find out. So we're updating our sea level rise strategy, and I think really what's going to happen, and this is what I'm excited to talk about today, is. Uh, you know, what we've learned, because we've really done this organically, this has really been at the city, and I'll talk about our partnerships in a minute because they're really key to what we do, but our pathways to resilience is the way I think we're going to build this out in a small city. So I'm really talking about a smaller city. We get about 145,000 people in it, um, and, uh, you know, a small southern coastal city, and I think these are the pathways to resilience for us, at least for probably the next three years or so. And the first one that probably doesn't come as a surprise to anybody, but it, it, it wasn't our number one when we started this, and that's land use, okay? Land use has to be number one from my perspective, and I think from our perspective. We can't make any more mistakes, okay? I believe, I'm confident we can fix the problems of the past. We've got smart engineers. You get enough money, enough good engineers, you can fix the problems of the past. The problem is you can't keep making problems, okay? Because then you're always playing catch up to try to fix the problems of the past and the problems you're making in the future. So I see land use, getting your land use strategy right, making sure that you're building where it makes sense to build and not building where it doesn't make sense to build is probably the first thing that any small coastal community needs to look at um, as they undergo on a resilient strategy. The second one is uh, regulations. Um, this was kind of a big aha moment for me was the, uh, the regulations piece. And I say that because I didn't understand just how important regulations were going to be. But when you start looking at it, you know, regulations come on a range. There's a minimum, and then you can go higher than that. Um, I think what we have to do is really start taking a look and getting together with smart engineers, smart scientists, smart, and start looking at where those regulations really do need to be. Um, I put into the regulation one. Um, Certainly our stormwater and floodplain regulations, but you know, the National Flood Insurance Program is a great program that really is ripe for some revision to bring it into where we are today and how it can help uh, smaller cities and certainly larger cities as well. But when you talk about elevation and you talk about acquisition or you talk about relocating, those are adaptation measures that are gonna allow cities to continue to have their uh, culture to continue to have what they've always been just in a different way and so really we need to take a look at how we can fund that um, and not wait for the big storm to have to go in and rebuild it how can we fix it on the front end now where it's a lot less costly instead of having to fix it and that's not rocket science to anybody in this room but that's just something that I thought would be important to uh, to, to point out um, this is something, the next one that I would want to talk about it with you is resources. And, you know, folks always say, well, yeah, well, it's resources, resources. But, you know, like I said, City of Charleston, we put, um, last year we invested $32 million into our flooding and drainage issues. It's a lot of money for a city of our size. It's a lot of money. Um, we are committed to, eight to, to $12 million a year. We just upped that from 2015 to 2018. Uh, in 2015, we were at $8 million. Today, we're at $12 million a year. We get about $31 million of accommodation and hospitality tax coming in. And that doesn't seem like a lot to some of the bigger locations and certainly folks that deal on the federal level. But for us, that's real money. 
Okay, that matters for us. So we're looking for ways to get more flexibility to be able to use that money um, the way we would need to 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 uh, to deal with both flooding. There's some restrictions on it, and we're working with our state senate and our state legislatures to be able to change some of those restrictions. There are six categories. We just want a seventh that says, hey, we want to use this for uh, flood protection and flood reduction. And being that we get six million visitors a year and they love to come to our city, we want to keep our city dry so they can enjoy our city that is. But likewise, I'd like to point out that I think there's a skills gap. Um, there certainly is a capacity gap at the small cities um, in terms of people looking at these things. One of the areas that came out of that review I talked earlier was that we in the city needed to add bodies to this focus. We didn't have a chief resilience officer last year. We had a, me doing it part-time with my full-time job. But we went ahead and added four bodies in 2018 just to really focus on flooding and floody type issues. And I, for us, that was a commitment to go ahead and make, and I think you'll probably see more in the future. But just as important is to bring people in with the right skills. Okay, people who have just been doing a job, um, you know, you, these are going to be in the future, and again, no surprise to the people in the room, but in the future, these are going to be folks with specific skills that can walk the halls of Congress here and talk about flood insurance and can talk about Army Corps of Engineer projects and can talk about how they're funded. That's a skill set that we need to build into both local communities and uh, regional efforts. Um, the fourth one, and this is my, another of my big aha moments, and this is, I think everybody will kind of get a chuckle out of this, is this, you've got to do outreach. If you're going to be successful in building resilience, you've got to do outreach, because my experience, if you're not out in front of telling people what you're going to do, you will spend all the rest of your time answering questions about what you're doing, okay? It's about getting out and putting that effort in up front to just get out and tell folks, this is what we're doing. So that was probably a lesson learned for me last year. I felt really good about doing something. I'm kind of an action person, and I wanted to get going and getting things done. And then, you know, we'll kind of surprise people at the end about what we're doing. Bad mistake. It's I, I got to get out front. We have to get out front. You got to tell people what you're doing. You got to show them what you're doing. And then you kind of got to get out and do it. So uh, if you don't, like I say here, if you don't do that, uh, it will consume you just answering those questions on the way out the door. And the last one that everyone really likes to talk about, and, and the other two folks up here did a great job today, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, is the infrastructure piece. Infrastructure really is going to, you know, that's, that's the hard part here. I say infrastructure is hard. Hard infrastructure is hard because it's hard, but it's also expensive. Okay, we, you know, we're easily, a small city like Charleston's got a billion dollar problem. I heard Nicole talking about a $50 billion improvement just to a wastewater treatment. So I was like, I mean, the scale is so completely different. But for us, a billion dollars is a lot of money. I mean, we typically don't use the B word. Um, but for us, it's, it's a lot of money, and how we go about getting that money really matters, and how we apply it and put it to work really matters. But infrastructure, that's it. I mean, our engineers are good today. I'm probably a bunch of engineers in the room, and they're, they're really good at what they do, and they can get us out of these problems that we've got ourselves into, as long as we're not making more problems down the road for them. So I think that's uh, kind of the, the, the five things that we talk about in the beginning, uh, I'm sorry, in, in the five pathways. In conclusion, I'll just finish by saying a couple of other things that we learned. One, um, although our journey is relatively short, I will say that the city of Charleston and the region of Charleston, um, we're really full of energy. We've got a great group of people down there who are really focused on this. And it's been kind of the ride for me. The, uh, the journey over the last four years has been really exciting coming out of the federal side, doing the military thing, and then coming out and working with just some great people in the city of Charleston and in the region. Um, those folks are committed to seeing this through, okay? It really doesn't matter what happens around them, they're going to see this through. I'm just convinced of that. Uh, the other thing that is kind of a big conclusion for all of us, this is a shared responsibility, and that was another big takeaway for me. Um, you're only going to be successful if everybody pitches in. And when I say everybody, it's government certainly has its spot, but businesses do as well. Neighborhoods and then individual homeowners. Everybody's got a piece in this. Uh, this is not, you're not going to win this just by government deciding what it's going to do. It's going to take really every homeowner in your small community up to your neighborhoods to, to make this work. And we're seeing that begin to happen. Everybody's talking about flooding in Charleston. And as we can give them 
ideas and things to do. It really is making a difference and beginning to make a difference. Building alliances, the other two guests today talked a ton about that. We too are really into building a larger alliance. I think, again, that's a strength of the Charleston region is that people love living in Charleston. They love being from Charleston. Uh, we have a group called the Charleston Resilience Network that mirrors some of the other groups you heard today. But, but it's different in that it's not chartered. It's a group of people that came together about three years ago, and it's represented by uh, federal, state, local uh, institutions of higher learning in the area, nonprofits. The Army Corps of Engineers is in there. Uh, NOAA comes to the meetings. And really, we get together just to deal on issues of resilience. It's a big tent. Everybody comes together. We have a pretty good record of attendance. Um, and we've had really some success of bringing our primary goal was bringing good science to the region. That was our goal. So that we could bring science to the region once, so not everybody had to pay for it four or five times. And we've been pretty successful in doing that. So alliances really do matter, uh, as folks here have said. And I don't want to undercut the importance of neighborhood associations. Uh, neighborhood associations that can get information out, provide uh, what the city is doing, but also let us know what their issues and concerns are, are a key component to this. Um, we do know now what got us here is not going to get us to the future. You know, there's a book like that, something similar to that, but we've kind of learned that. The other thing is it takes a while to turn a big ship. You know, Charleston's been going a direction it's been going for a long, long, long time. And big ships turn best when you alter courses just a little bit at a time. It keeps it from rocking, keeps it from turning up on the side, and you'll eventually get where you're going if you just keep changing the course a little bit at a time. It's got to be slow and deliberate. And this is our, uh, this other thing I would say is innovation. Uh, I think all three of us up here were all mentioned yesterday in the uh, Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge. I think Washington DC is in there. I know Miami's in there and Charleston's in there, uh, all moving to the next phase of the competition. So all three of these communities up front here are all about innovation and challenges and things like that. And I thought that was pretty exciting when I looked at and saw who was on here. So uh, good luck. Uh, <laughs> and I would say uh, finally, you know, this is our future. You know, bottom line is, what's, what's the alternative? You're just going to say, we're not going to do it? And the answer is no. Uh, we're going to do this. We, again, we love our community. We love what we do. We love the people that come to our community. Um, so we're going we're gonna, to, it's going to be a little different. As we get down the road, things will be different than they were in the past, but that's okay. Charleston's still going to be Charleston, and it's going to be a place where everybody wants to come. And uh, we're pretty excited about our future. So with that, I'll say thank you again, and I'll have a seat. Uh, you were all absolutely great. And the amount of information that you put forward and in terms of, I think, um, ideas and how you are approaching things is so incredible. And, and it was interesting hearing how each of you, in terms of these different areas, but yet so many similarities in terms of approach, which is so important in how we can all sort of help and learn from each other. So in, in terms of sort of picking up on that whole theme, I also, uh, right before we start Q&A, wanted to ask Jeremy Marcus to come up for uh, a couple minutes. Jeremy is with uh, Congressman Cartwright, and they have legislation that they have uh, uh, proposed, and again, it's right back to these themes of prepare. And, and in terms of thinking about resilience and, and in terms of coordination, the kinds of resources through which we can all learn from and help each other and making sure that our agencies all are working together and listening to each other. Jeremy, thank you. Well, thanks for giving me a few minutes to talk about um, a bill that my boss has uh, introduced now for the third straight Congress. And um, you know, we talked a lot, uh, we've heard a lot about the um, the local level of preparedness, but at the federal level, um, there's a lot more that we can do um, to make sure the the work that they're doing really um, has the resources they need and has the support from the federal government they need. So, a, a brief history back in 2013, for the first time, the Government Accountability Office came out with their um, every Congress they come out. Um, with their, um, their high risk list where the federal government is particularly um, exposed um, to fiscal risk and, and risk in general. And they put on the threat of a lack of preparedness um, for the first time, looking at that the federal government was not systematically preparing for um, risks um, and that's saying some agencies are doing a great job, some aren't. So working with the GAO and, and dozens of outside groups, 
we put together our Prepare Act, and it basically does three simple things. The first, it creates an interagency council that will look at preparedness federal government wide. The second thing it would do is make sure each individual agency has their agency plans to make sure that they are looking at what are the threats and what are the challenges from extreme weather that they're going to face and how are they going to complete their mission. And the third thing it does is creates an annual meeting and it creates regional plans so each region has their own um, specific plan of how to create resilience and prepare for extreme weather events. Um, and that's it. We've had it scored by CBO. It costs zero dollars. It's really just common sense, making sure that the entire government is adequately preparing. So um, the bill passed out of OGR by voice vote. It's currently being looked at by TNI. Um, but I, I hope many of you work for members. Um, I have a one pager. It's out front. I don't think it was there when you walked in, but it's there now. So. Um, you know, if you're interested, um, you know, I'll, I'll be around a little bit, um, pick up a one pager. Um, we love to build support. Um, uh, we have over 60 outside organizations endorsing the bill. It's been on the no National Taxpayers Union no brainers list. So um, it's, you know, it, it's got a lot, of, a lot of support. And I think this would be a great way at the federal government that we can um, help make sure we're better prepared and help get the information, the uh, regional preparedness that the local folks need. So thank you. Testing, testing. Uh, so let's open it up for, um, for Q&A. Uh, if any of you have questions or comments. Okay, go ahead. Hi, uh, Mark, thanks for coming up here today. Uh, question for the panel. Hi, um, what specific policies at the federal level would you like to see that would be of assistance to you all? Yeah, I, and for me, it, I've already mentioned it is uh, policy, policies, not funding, but policies would be taking a look at the National Flood Insurance Program and certainly how we may be able to increase um, perhaps funding for the inc increased cost of um, compliance, the ICC from 38 to 60. I think there's some discussion moving forward on that would make a huge difference for getting people up out of the, uh, the ability to raise their homes to get them up out of uh, flooding areas so that you know we, they wouldn't sustain any additional damage. Um, certainly I think there's another bill and I think it's the 2017 Flood Mitigation Act bill that's, that's out there right now that uh, is talking about the potential for the national flood insurance policy to be able to possibly buy out homes. It's a, it might almost be like a rider you could put on your policy to do that if you're in the in an area that floods frequently. And again, that would be a way that you wouldn't have to wait for these FEMA grants that take a while, and they're very competitive, and rightfully so, very competitive, but this would be something that could be done very quickly by communities uh, to be able to get those homes out of the, f the, the flooding areas so we can move on to, uh, to other things. So that would be mine. I think in the Washington region, one of the things, since we do have so much of a federal presence here, is that we need to um, work the localities with the federal agencies to get the work done right. So the policies in place of, of you know, some of what I think was talked about in the um, Prepare Act of making sure that they have these plans, that they have resources to be able to follow up with these plans and that they don't work alone. The Smithsonian, for example, put in some flood walls around some of their buildings after that um, early 2000s flood, but then I talked to the deputy um, director at GSA, and he's like, well, they're just pushing water into our buildings. Um, and so, and then Metro talks about, well, yeah, and they're just pushing the water in, down into this, into this big sump pump that we have under the ground here in Washington. Um, and so that type of coordinated activity um, and, and providing for that would, is particularly important here, and that it be coordinated with the work of the states with, and of the local um, and regional bodies in the area too, because again, the storms don't stop at the district line, they also don't stop at the, at the edge of the federal property. Well, uh, just to build on what Mark said, I think, you know, it's very frustrating as a coastal community that periodically uh, is threatened and is hit by hurricanes that we don't have the funding to do the vulnerable, the vulnerability mitigation ahead of time. The studies have shown that for every dollar spent, four dollars are saved. Um, and, you know, that would be my ideal dream is to be able to change the funding models so that we really can be proactive and save money in the end and lives and property, et cetera. Great, thank you. 
Other questions? Comments? Okay. I, oh, go ahead. Right. Thank you, guys. Great, great briefing. Um, so just from a cost standpoint, you're talking about billions, if not trillions, of dollars uh, worth of funding that's going to be needed. Where do you, do you have a feel for where that's going to come from? Everywhere. Um, one of the areas that we need to explore more is the relationship with the insurance industry and the savings that we can get from the, on the insurance side of things. And are there investments then that can, we can make using those funds in the type of resiliency actions that need to take place that in the end will, will reduce the insurance company's risks greatly um, and then be able to leverage some of those resources. So that's one example. Um, things like the debates that were happening here in the budget bills about um, tax-exempt financing and all of these other types of tools that are used for infrastructure financing are critically important, you know, with your funding to deal with the issues in the drinking water systems. Um, those are all critically important to be able to leverage as many different sources and, um, and kind of lower the cost of these projects on the financing side. They're going to be expensive. We are talking in, um, regularly in the, B, in the Bs around here. And then I guess in the halls of Congress, they talk about, well, you put, well, you know, talking about Bs, you talk about Ts. Um, but, um, um, but to be able to make those investments um, are, are going to be critical. And we need to be able to do the types of things that will allow us to finance them and pay them back over time. You know, we do have the de debates going on here in the district right now about the impervious service fees and, and surface fees and how much people are having to pay on those and what do the churches pay versus the homeowners pay versus others. Um, but, but we need to be able to keep it as efficient and, and, and multiple sources of funds so we can control these costs for people too. I just wanted to add um, with regards to insurance, as I mentioned when I was speaking, um, you know, in South Florida, insurance is a big deal. Uh, it's very expensive, and it continues to get more expensive. And so one of the things that we've been struggling with and are frustrated by is the fact that we are making changes. We are making uh, incremental changes to reduce our vulnerability, and we want to be able to value that. Um, so we've been having annual conversations with the reinsurance companies and our, our, um, our Beacon Council and really trying to push them to consider that because you know we are making investments as you mentioned skin in the game we definitely have that because we can't wait around for the state and the federal uh, government to come and fund what we need to do so um, I think that you know the insurance companies are certainly modeling this stuff but currently it's been a black box so that's what we hope to kind of make inroads into yeah, not, not to beat a dead horse, I think uh, exactly what they said is, is, is where we are, is it's going to take everybody to make the difference, right down to the individual homeowner. We're all going to have to pitch this together. Nonprofits are going to have to, you know, be willing to spend money on the things that are important to them if they want to keep them uh, as they want to keep them and where they want to keep them. It's just something that's going to have to happen in the future because this is going to be very expensive and it's going to take everybody. I was um, also struck in terms of your talking about the insurance and the reinsurance industry. Have you have you had fairly decent cooperation in terms of really bringing people to the table to talk about this, Nicole? We've absolutely had uh, cooperation. It's a, a very very important topic in South Florida. Um, but I, I, you know, I'd like to say I, I would prefer to see a little more um, tangible progress. But, but we have a lot of, we've had a lot of conversations, yes. So does she get an award for diplomacy here? <laughs> Listen to this, right? Yeah. Um, be, and I wanted to specifically ask about that too because um, uh, we have been doing a whole series of briefings with regard to resiliency. And, and we will be continuing to do that throughout this year, and so we will undoubtedly want to come back to, to all of you with regard to your ideas, your suggestions, and everything. And one of the things that we are hoping to do is to bring in folks from the reinsurance and insurance industry to talk about that and how it, it, their role and in terms of working with communities because the economic stakes, the human stakes are so 
great and so that we can, as you all have so elo eloquently said, everybody has sort of some skin in the game here and, and it's got to be people all kind of coming together to figure out the different roles and, and how we make this work. And I was also wanted to just mention that um, on March 2nd, we're doing a briefing looking at real estate and, and climate impacts and what this means. So um, the, factor, the economics of it, yeah. Another factor here that's just coming about is the rating agency's um, yes. treatment of the cities too and, and mm -hmm. how looking at, you know, Miami may be in better shape because if you're rating with the National Flood Insurance Program as a, you said, category five, five, CRS five. Uh, CRS five. Um, but that's another area that I think is going to be driving the types of things that the cities and the states and others will be needing to do. And again, it's kind of a, it, it's coming out of the same, I think, Genesis as the insurance companies work. And so, well, um, and all of those ratings in terms of the bond agencies and, and insurance all go hand in hand, right? Um, <laughs> um, any other questions? or comments okay up here if you could just wait for the microphone um so i am wondering uh mark you talked about a 1000 year flood event um and i believe nicole you talked about a category five hurricane and planning for these different levels of extreme weather events at what level do you see as the appropriate level um, of planning, kind of a measure twice, cut once. We know that some of our infrastructure needs to be uh, resilient in the long term up against 500 year floods, 100 year floods. And uh, if my memory serves, those terms are just based on probability of that event occurring. And we all know that probability is increasing. A 100-year flood is no longer a 100-year flood. Um, so, at, at what event, at what event probability are you guys starting to plan and focus on uh, planning? Well, I would say um, I don't have the exact answer for that. But what I would say is that we understand that bar is always going to be changing, and. Um, <coughs> We, we want to make sure that we're spending our dollars as efficiently as possible. So it doesn't make sense, for example, to design a pump for, you know, six feet of sea level rise. So what we're doing is, if you think about the curve that I showed you, um, and I mentioned the fact that we're looking at the criticality of the infrastructure and the lifespan of the infrastructure, and also looking at incremental steps that you can take um, so I, I like to give an example of what uh, Miami Beach has done in the sense that um, they've installed pumps and they ha there's a housing for the pump. And so they designed the housing to be able to house a larger pump. So they don't have to reconstruct that in the future knowing they're going to need a larger pump, but right now it doesn't make sense to build that, uh, to, to install that larger pump because it has a certain lifespan. So it's, I think it's that type of, um, as you were saying, you know, you've got to have the right expertise and really thinking about the steps you can take to kind of get you to the next plateau. And then by then, hopefully we have more technology, we have more information to understand what's the next most efficient and effective step to take. And, and I would just add to that, um, coming from the emergency management side of a city that's, you know, doesn't look that good on the maps when you look at some of these big events, um, that's, that's a community decision. Um, I mean, the community, you know, we're going to protect the critical infrastructure and, you know, that's what governments do is protect critical infrastructure so you can come back quicker and faster. But beyond that, it's really a community decision. Where do you want to spend your money? What is it you want to protect and how, to what degree do you want to protect it? Because really that's a trade-off between what you protect and what you want to spend. So do you want to spend it for the future? Do you want to spend it now? And I don't think any government would feel comfortable making those decisions other than making those decisions about the critical infrastructure that they're responsible for um, so that they can get back up and provide critical government services. You, you all mentioned at some point in terms of how important uh, working with the Army Corps of Engineers and NOAA have been. So uh, one question that I wanted to ask, because obviously issues around budget have been uh, roiling up here, 
And, and in terms of thinking about the kinds of resources or capabilities that, that agencies have been providing that, that are helpful to you or where you feel that there needs to be more, could you talk about key agencies you know, in terms of the work that you're doing on resilience and, and are there additional resource needs that, that you are seeing from those agencies? Well, I'll start uh, by commenting on the work that the South Florida Water Management District does. I mentioned that several times in my presentation because they are the regional manager of, of water. And as I mentioned, water is highly managed in Southeast Florida. And so um, depending on how they manage the water then determines how they're, they're the primary system, then the secondary system. So um, we have benefited from their engagement and they have some tremendous modelers that uh, have been a part of the work that we're, we've been doing at both the local and the regional level, key, key partners in this. And um, you know, it, there are questions, for example, of precipitation, mm -hmm. uh, what it's gonna be like in the future and there's kind of big holes in, in the data and we really understand that we can't think about what's happened in the past because things are changing. So the challenge is really trying to better understand what is the future going to hold? What are the changes going to be so that they can properly um, design and make the changes at that larger scale so that then we can understand how we need to respond at the next level? Uh, we mentioned the core and NOAA and their critical important. There's many others. CDC, for example, yeah. and looking at the health impacts of the changing conditions that we're facing in our area here and being able to, to look to see if we're getting different types of disease or different types of vectors and things that are available here. So it really goes across. We've used the Department of Energy Federal Labs to help look at microgrid um, as a um, way to harden critical infrastructure infrastructure and make sure it will work if the power does go down. Um, and we've been partnering with and looking at some of the things that have been done on DOD facilities as part of that. Mm -hmm. So it's really, a, um, I think, a broad, broad way. One of the other things that comes that, that I think is important is that we need to think about the making these investments over multiple years, that not just going up and down and up and down, but it takes a long time to get a lot of this stuff going from ideas to plans to designs to construction and then to operations. Um, and having that available over multiple years and having a more steady flow of dollars available for this work is critical. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just want to say thank you all very, very much. Really, really fascinating. Lots and lots of, of incredibly uh, important and very innovative work uh, that I think is so important for all of us to learn from. And we hope to uh, come back and keep learning more from you all. So don't be surprised if we, if you get calls from any number of us. But anyway, thank you very, very much for being here. Really, really appreciate it and appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you.